Okay, greetings to session number two of NARCON. Uh, I'm Will Marchant. Uh, this talk is about GPS systems for sport rocketry. Uh, uh, this is my amateur radio call sign. And here's contact information for me. And I will put that at the end of the talk as well. And if you have questions for me during the talk, please put them into the Q&A tab. Uh, that way I can uh, keep an eye on them a little bit easier than monitoring the chat tab. But I encourage everybody to um, uh, to network in, in chat during the talk. So once again, welcome and thanks for um, spending some of your time here uh, today. My background is in computer science, although I have a, a master's in space studies uh, through the space.edu distance learning program. And I uh, work professionally in aerospace at uh, the University of California, the Space Sciences Laboratory. Uh, here's a picture uh, from Space Sciences Lab looking out over the uh, San Francisco Bay towards the Golden Gate Bridge. So I don't spend a lot of time at Berkeley. Um, I spend most of my uh, time when I'm traveling. I actually telecommute, and I live in uh, northern Virginia. Uh, but uh, when I'm uh, working on projects, I typically spend a lot of it at uh, various customer sites uh, and at launch facilities. So here's a picture with uh, Bill Donikowski and me. We're working on the Orpheus Spas spacecraft in uh, uh, Space Shuttle Discovery's payload bay out on the launch pad. And then I've uh, been able to participate in two uh, Pegasus air launch uh, missions as the Berkeley on-site rep. Uh, and so that's a lot of fun working with the Pegasus. I'm currently working on uh, three programs at Berkeley. Uh, one is SphereX, which is an all-sky survey for um, uh, history of the universe. That's uh, a Caltech mission, and we're helping them out with that. Tracers is a space weather mission. And so it's very important to, to understand the Earth's atmosphere and how it interacts with the sun for things exactly like GPS, because uh, GPS is uh, uh, very affected by the Earth's ionosphere, which is very affected by the sun's output. And then MOAB is a fun project. We're doing a, a prototype chemistry lab uh, that we're hoping to put on a lander going to uh, Jupiter's moon uh, Europa um, in, in a while. So that's a lot of fun for me. Uh, I typically fly with Novar uh, here in the Northern Virginia area. I like all sizes of rockets, and I like all types of hobby um, propulsion systems. Uh, this is my level three project, a uh, uh, Polcat Aerospace Saturn V that uh, I never did actually paint. So um, uh, my apologies for that. So first, a little bit of a map, map refresher, because GPS is all about knowing where you are. And um, to know where you are, you have to have a common frame of reference. And so uh, in the case of, of GPS, that's typically latitude and longitude for us civilians. Uh, the, the military um, uses some other systems, uh, but uh, we won't talk about those today. So um, latitude, as you probably remember, is a number uh, typically in degrees that starts at the equator and goes north positive until you get to the equator where it's 90 degrees. Or if you're heading uh, south, uh, the numbers uh, increase negatively <laughs> uh, until you get to mi minus 90 degrees exactly at the uh, geographic South Pole. And uh, these are uh, different from magnetic coordinates. The Earth's magnetic uh, field is offset from the geographic pole. Uh, the current magnetic pole is somewhere around in here. Uh, anyway, that's why when you're uh, doing transformations between magnetic uh, headings and uh, GPS headings, um, it's different depending on where you are in the globe. The other thing to keep in mind when dealing with latitude and longitude is that there are some different formats. So um, you can do things in decimal degrees. Uh, some things are in degrees and minutes. That's the DM. And then some things are in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And uh, there's a slide on that just after this. And then uh, the, remember that um, east is typically a plus in longitude. So you can see this here. So starting at the prime meridian, which goes through Greenwich, England, um, longitude increases going uh, towards the east, and then west is negative. So here in North America, 
probably most of us are in North America, uh, we have negative uh, longitudes, uh, mi about minus 78 or 80 here on the East Coast. And then all of this is um, has to be referenced to something, and it's to, and it's a, that's a geodetic datum, and there are lots of those. Um, it's uh, Black History Month next month, so I wanted to mention Dr. Gladys West. Um, her, her PhD was from Virginia Tech, and she worked for the Navy and did a lot of the fundamental work in uh, WGS 84, World Geodetic System uh, 1984, which is the foundation for the GPS coordinate systems. You need to be a little bit careful. Um, you can set the output of your GPS to use different uh, datums. Typically, it's WGS-84. If you're using paper topographic maps, you need to be careful because some of those are in uh, North American Datum 27 or more recently, North American Datum 83. And if you're on a sailboat worldwide, um, each country typically has their own datum for uh, charts that matches up pretty well with WGS-84 but can be off by a few hundred meters. So if you're trying to sail your sailboat at night or in bad weather, you need to be really aware of uh, output of your GPS system versus uh, you know, what's being recorded on your charts. Uh, just a little bit of a refresher. Uh, this is a Google Earth map of um, uh, uh, Great Meadow, which is where Novar flies and where um, Tark flies. And so here's some coordinates of our uh, launch field here. In degrees, minutes, and seconds, there's latitude and longitude here, 38 degrees north, 49 minutes, 44.8 seconds. Notice it says north, there's no plus sign there. Notice this says west, there's no minus sign here. So you need to pay attention um, in raw decimal degrees, this is the format that you can use to cut and paste into Google Maps, for instance, where there's a completely decimal number for uh, latitude and then uh, for North America, uh, where I'm in Northern Virginia, a negative 77.8110397. And then uh, the third format you need to pay attention to is uh, where you have uh, a decimal degrees, but then there's a second number which is uh, digital minutes. And so uh, the seconds are, are basically baked into this as some of the least significant digits. And notice here again, um, there's a west, but there's no negative here. So you do need to be a little bit careful when you're transferring between different um, software and, uh, and paper systems about what coordinates you're using. So what is GPS? It's the Global Positioning System. Uh, that's kind of like the Kleenex name. Um, uh, Navstar is the official name for the US system. Um, it's satellite-based. Uh, GPS uh, came out of a military requirement um, where, they did, where they wanted small, inexpensive, relatively inexpensive handheld units that would not emit signals that could be traced by a military opponent. And so GPS, every, all the transmission takes place in outer space. It is a global system um, optimized for, for low to mid latitudes, but it will function at very high latitudes in the polar regions. Uh, it gives you time, position, and velocity. And the time is actually critical. Uh, there are lots of systems around the internet that depend upon GPS uh, receivers to generate a time hack for very precise things like financial transactions so you know exactly when money is being transferred and things like that. Uh, I mentioned that it's receive only. And um, really, uh, it, was, it was envisioned as a military system um, with a civilian subset. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but frankly, uh, the civilian use of this is, is massive. And, it's so massive that a number of other countries um, got a little bit nervous about having their civilian systems dependent upon a U.S. military capability. And so there are some essentially compatible systems. When you buy a GPS receiver today, it'll often listen to GLONASS, which is a Russian system. 
uh, Galileo is the uh, is the European system, and Baidu is the uh, is the Chinese system. And we're starting to see uh, receivers online that will use all of these uh, to 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 augment each other. So it's very interesting. Uh, GPS was really um, started because the military needed. Uh, a precision targeting capability for strategic weapons, especially mobile platforms like uh, bombers and submarines. Uh, it replaces um, uh, celestial navigation, although I'm happy to hear that uh, places like the US Naval Academy are starting to teach celestial navigation again as a backup uh, to uh, radio navigation systems. But there were uh, a number of early uh, radio and early satellite navigation systems and we'll see a little bit about those later. Um, uh, most of the uh, Galileo GPS GLONASS systems are in a, a semi-synchronous orbit. Uh, geostationary orbits take 24 hours for the for the satellite vehicles to go around the Earth, and so they, uh, if they have a low inclination orbit, um, so if they sit right over the equator, uh, they tend to appear not to move in the sky, and that's really good for uh, commercial installations um, at numbers of sites. So your home satellite TV system uh, doesn't have to have a moving antenna because the uh, satellite that it talks to uh, is in geostationary orbit and you can point uh, the antenna at that once and, uh, and then it'll just stay pointing there. The navigation satellites tend to sit in semi-synchronous orbit so they um, uh, they go around the Earth in about every 12 hours, so in fact they do move. But um, your GPS receiver typically doesn't need to uh, point at these spacecraft because they uh, they blanket the area of the Earth that they're over flying. Uh, GPS started uh, flying in 1978, uh, but replacements with improvements are uh, constantly being uh, sent into orbit as old spacecraft uh, age, uh, electronic systems degrade and fail, uh, and GPS satellites also uh, have propulsion systems on board so that they can maintain uh, very precise orbits. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about limitations of GPS, and um, uh, people can bring some stuff up in the chat if they want. We can try and discuss that later. But um, I've, I've got some slides here. Uh, right off the bat, I did want to summarize, though, some of the uh, older school uh, radio navigation systems. And this is a chart that shows uh, how, as we've moved forward in time, uh, some of the earlier navigation systems, uh, you know, weren't all that great. You know, they were fine if you were in the middle of the ocean and you needed to go which know which direction to go to um, to get to port. but uh, being, uh, you know, a half a mile off when you get to port isn't really much good for navigating in the fall, uh, in the fog, uh, or in bad weather. Um, and, and inertial navigation systems, so systems that measure uh, the acceleration and, and deceleration and uh, direction that your system is moving, uh, those are pretty popular on rockets, but those um, tend to and so um, you can build up large errors very rapidly if you don't have a, an absolute reference system like GPS that you can use to beat those errors down. So inertial is really good um, for, uh, uh, for integrating with a GPS system. Uh, GPS is good for absolute, but it's not really good for very quick reaction stuff. And so combining a GPS system with an inertial system uh, gives you the advantages of both the quick reaction time of inertial, but then uh, uh, the the fact that GPS doesn't drift and allows you to go back to your to your absolute location. Transit and TACAN are still somewhat used, although I think most of it's been uh, decommissioned. Loran uh, basically been decommissioned. That was very popular with um, the boating community, and then you get down here into GPS where you can see you get, um, you know, handfuls of meters of accuracy, which is really pretty good. It's not good enough for landing your aircraft. Um, uh, most aircraft landing systems that I, uh, are, uh, I'm aware of still use a barometric altimeter, um, kind of like using the inertial nav system. You use the, uh, the, the barometric altitude to 
uh, refine your uh, your altitude measurement in combination with GPS. But some things about accuracy. Um, I, I left selective availability in here because GPS was a military system initially. Um, uh, it was designed to have a civilian component, which we're still using, um, but there was a capability for the military to degrade that um, civilian component, and that was called selective availability. That got um, uh, disabled. It's still in there as far as I know. It could be enabled, but got uh, disabled uh, at the beginning of the century. Um, the ionosphere is by far the largest largest um, error uh, induced into GPS systems. And it's because those radio signals that are coming down from the satellite systems have to go through the Earth's ionosphere. And as, um, as that heats and cools, it expands and contracts. And as um, particles and, and blasts of ionized gas come from our sun, it causes disturbances in the ionosphere that affect the travel time of signals going from outer space down to the surface of the Earth and to, and to places like aircraft. So a big part of um, space weather these days is, uh, is figuring out how the sun affects and how the ionosphere affects radio signals so that we can then predict um, what, uh, what's going to be happening to uh, your GPS accuracy in the future. And this is basically equivalent to being able to want to have an accurate weather forecast so that your um, military aircraft know when to fly, when they can safely fly. Um, if you're doing precision bombing or precision navigation, it's good to know when your GPS system might be having issues due to space, we space weather issues. And finally, uh, if there are any um, surveyors in, in the room, they'll know that uh, the, the geometry of the global positioning uh, system satellites actually affects the accuracy as well. So um, if you have, uh, if your receiver uh, is listening to four satellites and they're very close together, um, GPS functions by uh, knowing the, the time of flight from the spacecraft to your receiver, and then um, it basically uses that to calculate where your position is on the surface of the Earth. And if the four spacecraft that you're listening to to get latitude, longitude, and altitude are very close together, then um, any changes in that time of flight uh, mean that um, uh, it reduces the accuracy of your, of your position solution. And so uh, surveyors will um, study ahead of hand, and they'll pick a time of the day when they can pick spacecraft, a GPS spacecraft that are in an optimum uh, orientation in their orbit so that they can get the most accuracy in their um, uh, in their solution. And uh, David Kane says, um, uh, if he recalls, the underlying GPS math is based on a 3D Cartesian space that favors no dimension. Um, if that's the case, why is altitude considered the weak spot in accuracy? Yeah, that's excellent um, question. Dave, and um, it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but typically the latitude and longitude accuracy for um, uh, a GPS solution is, is good to a handful of meters, and the accuracy is only good to tens of meters. And I assume that that's something to do with the fact that, um, that the spacecraft altitude is, is it's much greater in, in relation to the XY position or the latitude longest position on the, um, uh, uh, on the surface of the Earth. So we can try and answer that later um, if we can. And, um, and I'm sorry, there was a question in there about the GPS accuracy of accelerations, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. One of the other big uh, GPS limitations is in signal blockage, um, and that's uh, uh, if you're inside a building, uh, if you're inside an RF blocking housing for your uh, rocket, for example, or if you're in a city where um, uh, there can be reflections off of buildings that can confuse um, uh, <laughs> the, the accuracy of the GPS receiver. Um, there's a question about uh, uh, COCOM uh, restrictions, and I'll address that in a little bit, um, uh, Sierra Mike. And then, um, 
Uh, there are GPS limitations, rocket velocity of rocket general satellite, your signal velocity change through the atmosphere. Uh, yes, Daniel, that's correct. And um, we'll talk about a little, a little bit about those in, in a slide. Um, so more about uh, GPS limitations. Um, if you're if you're going to be using uh, GPS for tracking your rocket or aircraft or whatever, then obviously you need telemetry to send that down, to send the data down, the position of the rocket or the UAV or whatever it is you're tracking. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then um, uh, people are asking about some of the uh, the restrictions on GPS. And uh, because this is a, a military system, uh, people who are selling GPS receivers are uh, required to implement some some restrictions on those to prevent them from being uh, weaponized. And what's interesting is that manufacturers interpret those uh, how to implement that differently. Um, but in general, there's um, there's an 18 kilometer altitude restriction, and there's a 515 meter uh, per second restriction. Now, what this typically means is that you would expect a high altitude amateur radio balloon up at 100,000 feet um, that's very high but is moving very slowly to work um, perfectly. But that's often not the case. Um, uh, manufacturers seem to see that if they violate either of these cr criteria, that they will then do something like only send down one solution per minute. And so, uh, the amateur radio balloon community goes out and um, uh, they figure out which GPS receivers um, behave uh, differently at altitudes, like, you know, which one will, will operate perfectly normally at 100,000 feet as long as you're moving slowly. For rocket people, um, this is a real issue, and so you need to um, work with the vendor of your GPS system to see if they have restrictions. Um, if they do have restrictions, you have to go to the manufacturer themselves and figure out if you can get a waiver to buy a, uh, um, you know, a, a GPS receiver that will work in uh, at 100,000 feet, for example. Um, one of the uh, questions was acceleration in um, in GP uh, in uh, high power rockets. And so um, part of that is this uh, is this velocity equation. So you know if you're going to be violating the the speed in your rocket flight, then you're going to have to do a lot of homework with the vendor to try and figure out if your rocket is going to work. Low cost GPS receivers will also lose acquisition due to a thing called jerk, which is the change in rate of acceleration. And so it's not uncommon for you to see um, your GPS receiver lose. Um, uh, lock during boost, um, but then hopefully it will reacquire um, uh, during uh, the coast to altitude. And there are some things you can do about that. Um, you can uh, set firmware to air mode. There are often uh, different uh, modes in the GPS receivers where you can pick uh, how their software algorithms work. And um, uh, so typically there's a setting to say whether you're on a boat, whether you're in a car, or whether you're in an aircraft. I'm not aware of any firmware settings, at least I haven't seen any in any of the GPS receivers I've used where you can set rocket mode. Um, you also need to check for RF, radio frequency opaque materials in your rocket. So carbon fiber or any um, metallic stuff um, is probably going to interfere with not not only the reception of the GPS signal, but also with the um, transmission of any of your um, uh, telemetry data. And so, once again, this is a case of uh, just like with your deployment systems, you need to try and do as much realistic testing before flight as possible. Um, so have your your telemetry systems running when you're doing altimeter tests to make sure that there's no interference with your altimeter. Um, make sure that your um, that the all threads, you know, the metal all thread holding your avionics bay doesn't affect the um, transmission of your signals and and create a um, uh, sort of a directional effect where you can only get telemetry in one direction, for example. 
Um, you need to be aware of the type of GPS an antennas and their orientation. And um, I've got some pictures later on of some uh, some various GPS receivers, and I will um, I'll try and point out the typical patch antenna that's used that um, is only good uh, for uh, one hemisphere. It's not a uh, you know a full sky receiver. It just uh, uh, listens to half. GPS satellites in half the sky. And so if your rocket lands, for example, and that's pointing down towards the ground, your GPS receiver may not, um, you know, may stop getting updates. So uh, I think it's vitally important for you to um, have some met method of uh, receiving the GPS signals uh, or any of your telemetry signals during your rocket's descent so that when it uh, lands on the ground, uh, if the GPS is blocked, you aren't in trouble. Um, and if the telemetry transmission uh, transmissions themselves stop because you landed in a ditch or um, you, you're underwater or the antenna gets blocked uh, in some fashion, you uh, still know good enough where to go to hopefully start uh, receiving sig uh, signals again. Um, and this is also, uh, I'll put in a plug for um, various uh, beeper systems. Uh, GPS is great to getting you within 10 or 20 meters of, uh, of your rocket. If you're in a cornfield, that may not be good enough. And so you may uh, really appreciate having a, a beeper that would make some audible sound that you could, um, you know, go, go the last few meters to find your rocket. Now, we were talking earlier about, um, about a jerk, which is a, you know, the change in acceleration of your rocket that may cause your GPS to uh, uh, to lose reception. And uh, I've heard, um, and, and frankly, uh, a lot of my GPS receivers are wrapped in bubble wrap, so they have a rather um, soft mount um, that uh, the theory is um, will help to uh, avoid loss of signal on boost and uh, during events such as is deployment. Um, I think a, a fascinating um, NARAM, NARAM science talk might be to uh, put dual GPS receivers in, in rockets, one hard mounted and one soft mounted, and compare the data and see if you can draw any conclusions. So there you go, somebody's NARAM science fair talk. Um, it sounded like uh, a fair number of people were currently using GPS. You might want to just um, call that out in the uh, chat session if you're if you're curious. We can try and discuss that later. So, lots of different uses for GPS. Um, the military has got some cool systems. This is a uh, um, a precision payload delivery system that's got a steerable para parafoil on it. I know uh, Tim Van Milligan at Apogee is working um, on a commercial system that he's hoping to sell to all of us. And um, uh, if you go over to Rocketry Forum, uh, there are uh, at least a couple of threads dealing with um, systems like this. But uh, so GPS, um, we've been talking a little bit about tracking. Um, using it for onboard logging is great, and uh, I'll show you an example of something that, that I did. Um, uh, there was a fun article in uh, Sport Rocketry last month about using Arduinos, uh, little microcontroller systems, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and it looked like he was rigging uh, that up for doing dual deploy. Um, I I'm probably not brave enough to do that, um, especially given GPS's um, altitude issues. I, I would much prefer to have a barometric um, altimeter for that. But um, uh, there's certainly a lot of research applications, so I'll talk a bit about a, uh, a data logging system that I've put together that I'm flying, um, and I haven't flown it with the GPS receiver yet on a rocket. Um, but GPS is wonderful for getting um, absolute time hacks for your data, because um, it's often very difficult to, um, in the heat of launching your model rocket, uh, keeping good um, notes about exactly when the rocket is on the launch pad and when events are starting. So having a GPS time hack is um, uh, is wonderful. Um, and then uh, GPS is also great for flight and attitude control stuff, especially when combined with an inertial navigation system 
or as the model aircraft people are doing with um, external uh, infrared horizon sensors. And I'd love to see um, Frank Burke, for example, at Dinosaur Rocketry um, uh, use some of those uh, flight control systems to make hands off um, uh, basically uh, rocket glider versions of his, um, his aircraft. And that's on my long list of um, projects that I'd like to do, but um, you know, too many toys and too little time. And uh, David Graper um, uh, comments that I have a featherweight tracking system to use with my iPhone and also Egg Finder GPS. Uh, those are two great systems. I have uh, links to those up on the web page that I posted early in the chat session. Uh, and he says he has trouble with both of them to the point I do not trust the information I received from them. So David, we'll um, uh, try to address some of those questions um, a little bit later. Um, you know, that's one of the problems and opportunities, perhaps, of these systems. Um, if you're tired of just flying and reflying your rocket and you want to try flying some payloads that may be more or less challenging, uh, I think trying to put GPS in your in your system can be can be really cool and can be an opportunity for a lot of fun and, and perhaps frustration and wailing and gnashing of teeth in the hobby. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some some current uh, products. Uh, there's a lot of consumer stuff out there for doing GPS tracking. A lot of it's based on cell phones. Um, you need to be a little bit careful about um, cell phone coverage at your launch site and uh, all the issues uh, associated with losing signals once the, uh, once the rocket lands. So I'm not going to really talk much about the <clears throat> there are um, a lot of uh, drone uh, tools uh, that are out there. I'm not going to talk about those a lot, although um, one of the <coughs> excuse me, one of the projects I'll show you later, um, I put together an Arduino system uh, that some of my wife's students use to fly on their quadcopter. So I'm really going to talk about uh, rocketry specific products. So here are two things from uh, BigRedB.com. There's a plain old um, tracking transmitter. These are both um, uh, at uh, the 70 centimeter hand band, so they're like 440 megahertz. That's why you get a, a short antenna like that. Um, this uh, US quarter is for size comparison. This battery goes with that tracking transmitter. Uh, this is one of his um, uh, Beeline GPS units. So you can see the uh, the GPS antenna, patch antenna, um, uh, underneath there. That patch antenna will only really look at half the sky. And then, uh, once again, this is 440 um, uh, megahertz, so it's the 70 centimeter ham band. This will record all the GPS data on board so you can download it um, after the fact. But it will also transmit... Um, uh, a subset of that data in real time over an amateur radio protocol called um, APRRS. And uh, we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Uh, here's a cool little GPS transmitter from um, Altus Metrum. This is their GPS offering. You can see it's much smaller, uh, not much larger than the GPS patch antenna itself. Once again, this antenna is good for half the sky. And so if your rocket lands and uh, that antenna is pointing down towards the ground, you might lose updates in the GPS um, position. Here's a little lithium ion battery that'll um, power this thing all day. And this is a cool um, a tracker sled from a place called Lab Rat Rocketry. I haven't flown this yet, but um, you can see the four holes where uh, the Altus Metron GPS um, uh, can get screwed onto that sled. The battery goes on the back side, and then this all uh, slides into a casing. And you put a um, uh, a bolt back here um, with an eye on it, and then you can just hang this inside your rocket um, on on the recovery harness. So this is a great way for you to um, uh, basically retrofit a rocket that might not have an avionics bay. Uh, for GPS tracking. Um, 
So lots of options out there for, for tracking, um, but one thing that you might want to do is just uh, log the data on board. And I mentioned that there are um, commercial options. I think basically all of the commercial hobby rocketry GPS tracking systems will uh, let you download data after the fact. But um, if you want to do your own science project and record your own data, then um, this is a, a great time to be alive um, in terms of all the uh, maker hobby products that are out there uh, for flying uh, roll your own electronics. And Arduino um, platform is a great one. There was a lovely article in uh, Sport Rocketry last month about flying uh, an Arduino in a in a conventional platform size, which is uh, uh, about the size of a small paperback novel, maybe a little bit smaller. The boards I like are from a company called Adafruit, um, and they have a, a, a form factor called Feather. Um, so Arduino users out there, I, I encourage you to shout out in the chat and uh, and stand proud about that. And here's a picture of of an Arduino computer. So it's implemented on on that chip, and this is the Adafruit um, Feather format. So it's got two headers, and it's designed to stack additional boards to do all sorts of different stuff. You can get um, telemetry boards, transmit and receive telemetry. So if you want to do the NAR high power, um, uh, you know, there's a follow on to NAR Trek um, skills level uh, dealing with um, uh, high power rocketry, although there's no reason why you couldn't do it on low power rockets. Um, but one of them is to uh, fly a telemetry rocket system. So you could take one of these uh, Arduino feathers that's also got room on it for an SD RAM card so you can record data on board. You could plug a GPS card into it. This one has got space for a battery backup for the GPS, and that's critically important. When the GPS wakes up, um, unless it remembers from a battery backup, it won't know where it is. And it has to listen to the spacecraft for uh, new receivers, might start up and start giving you a position in uh, 30 seconds. Uh, traditional receivers, older receivers, so if you buy something uh, at a uh, uh, from another rocketeer, it could be 15 minutes before the uh, receiver uh, gets enough information from from the uh, spacecraft to actually fix its position. So I encourage folks to um, to get a system that allows a battery backup and then to turn their GPS system on uh, a half an hour before uh, they start packing it up so that the information of the GPS receiver can get updated and be battery backed up so that when you fly, it's got uh, it's got fresh data. Uh, this is um, uh, from Adafruit. Uh, they also sell GPS receivers that you can attach wires to and you can attach to um, your computer project, uh, not in this Feather format. So notice it's also fairly small, but a little bit larger than in the Feather format. Uh, here's a Feather format um, system I put together for uh, an Estes Green Eggs payload. A base. So this is um, this is a BT65 um, payload bay. Uh, the nose cone nor normally comes uh, with a couple of conic sections here that you can cut out, and then you can cut uh, little bits off of the um, little shoulders on a piece of plywood so that you can close this nose cone. And then these are just removable rivets. So this is a uh, an Arduino feather. Um, computer with a uh, SD RAM card. This is a receive only, uh, a listen, it's a, uh, there's no uh, tracking uh, transmitter stuff in this. So it just uh, records data on the SD RAM card. Uh, this is an, an inertial measurement unit. Um, so the uh, um, the Arduino is, uh, is recording acceleration and um, attitude stuff at 100 hertz and uh, during flight and then stores it. Uh, on board, and then these little things are um, are smart pixels. So these are uh, red, green, blue uh, pixels that the Arduino can controls and uh, 
I, there are four of them. They're daisy chainable, so you can have hundreds of these things hooked up to an Arduino and uh, have it do various light flashing patterns. So this is what I flew at the uh, last Novar um, night launch. And uh, that GPS receiver, um, you can see the wires, that's going to get attached to this thing, and it'll be up in the nose cone so I can also log GPS data. Because it was incredibly difficult trying to figure out what the IMU data uh, equated to, because, you know, you turn this thing on, you prep it back, and then you're carrying it out to the launch pad, you're putting it up, you're waiting for it to get flown. Um, it was tough to, to figure out exactly what the data was, so I'm looking forward to having GPS time hacks in this thing real soon. Um, ham radio operators, uh, shout out, and we will talk a little bit about um, some of the telemetry considerations. So. If you want to get your GPS data back, or even if you just want to track uh, your your uh, your rocket, um, so this researcher um, she is tracking uh, mountain lions that have a collar um, around their neck with a uh, just a transmitter in it. Uh, they typically just use a transmitter because uh, it's a lot lower power than trying to run a GPS receiver at the same time and then telemetering data. So uh, this mountain lion's transmitter will probably wake up once a day and do some chirps for a while and then go back to sleep to save um, battery power. Um, but what she's doing here is she's got a directional antenna where um, she'll sweep the horizon and the signal will be stronger where this antenna is physically pointing. So one of the really cool things about your um, ham radio transmitter systems is that as a backup, uh, if you can't get good GPS signals or if the signal gets weak for some reason because you're down in a ditch, you can often use a directional antenna to figure out where the rocket is um, so that you can get close enough to start getting um, uh, good telemetry again. So we talked earlier about the, about the uh, commercial systems that use cell phone. Um, that's a decision that you'll just have to make. And then uh, the other decision for hobby rocketry stuff is – um, do you want systems to transmit in the ham bands, or uh, do you want to use some of the um, non-ham transmitters that are typically in the 900 megahertz unlicensed band? Once again, um, I'm a dedicated ham. I think it gives you a lot of flexibility because you can do this radio direction finding capability, whereas some of those 900 megahertz systems that use spread spectrum to allow it to be um, uh, unlicensed so that lots of people can share the frequency without interference. Um, these are very difficult or impossible to um, to do direction finding on. And so that's something that, that you'll want to consider. Lots of different frequency bands. Um, so two, meter, um, uh, two meters is the wavelength of the 145 megahertz um, ham radio band, and so you'll often hear people use 2 meter or 145 megahertz interchangeably. One of the nice things about using uh, the ham bands is that you're, um, uh, you can often uh, change the frequencies of your tracking transmitters, and so if you find interference, you go to a large launch and there are lots of people using um, a system, uh, you do have flexibility to pick different um, frequencies. There are a couple commercial systems that um, think that they can be unlicensed using the wildlife tracking bands. Uh, the, the jury's out on whether that is uh, legitimate or not. Um, uh, this is also uh, often uh, uh, systems used in falconry for fal uh, tracking falcons, and so they have very small transmitters um, and uh, very good direction finding systems uh, for some of this wildlife tracking stuff. There's a seldom used 225, 222 to 225 um, ham band. Uh, Alpha Communications used to use this for their uh, rocket hunter systems. I think that those are pretty much legacy at this point and that they've moved up into the uh, 70 centimeter, 440 megahertz uh, ham band. And so this is where the big red B stuff, most of the big red B stuff is. Uh, this is where... Um, all the Altus Metrum stuff is, as far as I know. Big Red B does do some, some two-meter um, systems, but it's mostly up in 440. You do have to be a little bit careful because um, 440 megahertz, um, the ham band, ham usage is um, secondary to other users. And so if somebody else is using the frequency that you want, um, you are not allowed to just transmit over them. You have to move elsewhere. 
And there's a very popular 443.92 megahertz used by home weather stations, for example. Um, so there's lots of commercial stuff that uses this. You probably want to stay away from there. And then uh, there are a lot of 900 megahertz commercial systems. The Big Red B uh, license-free option is there. And I think that um, uh, some of the other uh, commercial rocket tractors are up there. And then there's, um, of course, all the Wi-Fi stuff. And if you're doing an Arduino, roll your own. Um, you can get Wi-Fi transmitters and then just run your, your own LAN, which is really cool. Um, using the data, um, lots of things. Big Red B, for example, will let you post-process uh, the data to produce KML files for Google Maps. Uh, here's a flight I did a few weeks ago um, at Great Meadow. So you can see um, I basically, uh, you know, this transmission, the, the, the transit time to altitude was so quick, I basically didn't get any, any good fixes. But then um, I got a lot of fixes, and you can see some of the noise in the GPS position as the rocket's drifting down. So, you know, GPS, um, if you just put it on the table and start recording data, you'll, you'll see the position move around over the course of a few hours in a day. Um, there are lots of apps. So a lot of the, um, the vendors um, uh, who are selling track it, tracking stuff, um, they may send, sell you a, um, a dedicated receiver that will show where your rocket is. But a lot of them also have uh, Bluetooth-enabled stuff with apps that will show you on a map. Uh, there are some computer tools, especially for the APRS data that comes down in your, um, uh, in your HAM uh, transmissions. Um, there are computer tools that will let you plot that data and do analysis of those. And then uh, there are a bunch of standalone tools. So, for instance, uh, Tim Van Milligan's Simple GPS Tracker, it's got a, a handheld device that will give you uh, range and bearing to your rocket. And there are, uh, there are a handful of um, amateur radio handheld transceivers. Uh, the THD-74 is one that um, sadly just recently uh, has come off the market because of a fire in a manufacturing facility. Um, uh, that will not only uh, let you talk on all the amateur radio frequencies, um, but it'll also let you uh, receive your um, Big Red B or uh, um, Altus Metrum uh, will also transmit APRS position uh, packets. Uh, this thing will receive those, and it'll show you relative to you the, um, the heading and distance to your rocket. And then if you use the uh, the 2 meter um, 144.39 uh, megahertz uh, APRS band, um, any receiving station that picks those up and is also hooked up to the internet uh, will relay, relay those out to a uh, world, worldwide net network and uh, it'll plot that data on websites like APRS.FI so you can follow your high altitude balloon or your, or your rocket or your UAV as it flies uh, on the internet. So we're coming up on 10 minutes to the hour. Um, I'm going to sit on this slide for a minute. Um, I put together a web page, uh, and I uh, also put the URL early in the chat. Um, you can go there to a copy of these slides and also links to um, some of the manufacturers I know about. It's not an exhaustive list, um, but it's uh, some of the ones that I'm aware of. If you send me an email message, uh, email message, I'm happy to add uh, other manufacturers to that list if, if there are people uh, who want me to. And uh, uh, one of my email message uh, addresses is marchant um, at, at course, um, novar.org, and that'll get to me. Um, so uh, Dave Thomas is asking, uh, do all the handband transmitters require a license regardless of power output, or are low power transmitters allowable without license? You know, that's an excellent question, Dave. And um, some of the manufacturers, I think I mentioned earlier that there was a manufacturer in the 220 megahertz um, ham band who uh, was marketing for a while a, a, a transmitter there that they said did not require a license because the transmit times and power on the signal were so low that they fell below the licensing requirement. So I'm not a lawyer, um, and 
uh, I started to look at those regulations, and frankly, um, it was too complicated for me, and I got a headache, and I'm a ham radio operator, so I moved on to another product um, where I don't have to worry about the, um, the legality of that. So I think my answer is that basically, um, trust what the manufacturer tells you. If the manufacturer tells you that it's license free or license is required, then I claim you've done due diligence and you could stand up in front of the FAA or the FCC, sorry, um, who do issue um, large fines occasionally for misusing the frequencies. So uh, it's not uncommon for amateur radio operators who are, who are misbehaving on the waves to get um, fines of handfuls of thousands of dollars. Um, so uh, I, I would trust the manufacturer on that. And then uh, if you follow the manufacturer's recommendations, I don't think you can go too far wrong. Uh, so that's kind of my answer there. And most of the manufacturers will require you to supply a call sign up front um, if uh, if they think that their product need, needs that. Now, um, if you really want to fly a ham transmitter or, or, or whatever, um, getting your license is pretty easy. But another um, path that might be interesting is there are amateur radio clubs all over the world. And I would go to some of the amateur radio club meetings, and um, there are often a lot of people there who are involved in an amateur radio hobby called fox hunting, where they go out and they hide a transmitter, um, and then the game is for the rest of the people to try and find it. And so you could go to the local ham club and say, hey, I'm interested in flying some of these payloads. Is there somebody there who would like to be my ham radio um, technical um, mentor and, uh, and sponsor these flights? Now, legally, those people have to be there when you're using the stuff. So it's not like they can just give you permission to use their call sign. But it would be a way for you to get um, somebody technically involved in your, pro in your uh, project. And it might save you a lot of money because people might loan you equipment for receivers and things like that. Um, have you done anything with GPS RTK for better accuracy? So that's a great question, Daniel. Um, so most of the GPS receivers these days um, have a thing called WAS, Wide Area Augmentation System, built in. Where they, where they receive information about making compensation um, for the ionospheric signals, uh, for the uh, ionospheric disturbances. And um, uh, so you basically, if you're buying a modern receiver, you basically get that for free. What, what Daniel is talking about is um, RTK is real-time kinematics. And for instance, surveyors, you'll see surveyors, um, they set up a tripod in one location and then they're off doing measurements somewhere else. What they're doing is that is that fixed location, they know where that is very precisely and they type that very precise location, that surveyed location um, into that unit. That unit then listens to the GPS signals from all the various satellites in it and it measures the errors because it knows um, exactly where that receiving station is. And it then, um, typically for surveyors, there's, there's, there's then a short range uh, radio link that will talk between that base station and the remote unit that the surveyor is using. And it'll send correction information that, you know, over a short distance of a kilometer or so maybe, um, will vastly increase the accuracy of that mobile station, um, sometimes down to centimeters. So, uh, so that's what RTK is about. Um, there's starting to be some hobby level RTK systems. Um, SparkFun Electronics has got a unit um, that is, a, I think it was three or four hundred dollars each. Um, so you would need at least two of those. I'm trying to talk my wife into buying a couple of those for her project, you know, for the student projects that um, I help her fly on uh, on her UAVs. Um, but she hasn't she hasn't bid on that one yet. But I will I will persevere. So I haven't. But it's a it's a fascinating thing, and it's starting to come into the hobby market. And there is post processing you can do. So if you record enough satellite information on board your rocket, um, there are systems on the web where you can then come back, you can upload that data, and uh, post process the data um, to get uh, higher accuracy positions for your rocket. 
So um, uh, I hopefully that answered that. And then Robert Belknap says that um, he can't see the slides. So um, if you go down to, and I'm going to post in the chat session. If you go down to that web page at the very bottom, there should be a um, a thing that says, here is a set of the presentation slides. And click on here. And when I do that, it loads a, um, it loads a PDF for me. So um, send, me, send me an email. Um, Uh, Robert, if you still can't get it, and I'll um, I'll email it to you um, separately, or we can uh, we can work for it. And we've got about four minutes left. I'm happy to sit here and answer questions, and I'll I'll transfer over to the chat um, once I stop the broadcast at the top of the hour. But um, uh, I'll still answer some questions here, um, or people, of course, are welcome to go off to some of the other um, excellent talks. Um, Daniel says that um, he liked the RTK answer, and he wants to do the post-processing stuff. Um, excellent. So I'm glad uh, I'm glad you enjoyed this, and Robert, I'm glad you found the slides, and. Um, you know, I think this is really the start of the journey for people. Um, send me an email if you'd like to see me write this up for sport rocketry or something. I was thinking about maybe trying to write something up about that feather payload with the GPS, because the article last month was using the, um, the sort of canonical Arduino form factor, which is larger. Um, uh, that Arduino that I showed you earlier, that flies really nicely on a, um, uh, a C24 um, millimeter motor. Um, and so it's, a, it's great for small field stuff. And it's a, a fun platform where you can, uh, you know, do your own, um, where your own, do your own thing and do your own experimenting and stuff. And uh, I expect that, um, you know, with all this coverage that, you know, we may see some partnerships. If you're, um, if you don't like programming, for example, but you really like building um, stuff, I would encourage people to uh, try and form some consortiums to maybe do some group projects. And Bruce Canino um, was suggesting that maybe uh, he might start up a, a, a Saturday Zoom club forum called uh, Tech Saturdays, I think is what he was talking about. I think that could be a really cool way of bringing people together with different school skill sets so that they can uh, uh, maybe do some of these uh, projects if they aren't comfortable with programming or aren't comfortable with soldering, but maybe they could bring stuff to the um, to the table. Uh, so thanks, Steve. I'm glad you liked the talk. Uh, Michael, thanks. I'm glad you think an article might be interesting. Um, and. Uh, David Kane says, have had problems getting sensible GPS deployment results after boost phase. Yeah, I don't expect it to track the boost. Under, um, under shoot, I do okay, but after boost location, moves all over the place by maybe a thousand feet between solutions. Any thoughts? Um, boy, I'd, uh, David, that's an interesting one. I would really look at um, your battery systems and making sure that you aren't losing um, battery power to your GPS receiver, because if it's if it's dropping ephemeris or almanac data, it might be, um, uh, you know, falling back onto some coarser solutions um, while it's still trying to recover. Um, so an Arduino for this would be perfect because you could re record a bunch of ancillary, ancillary data about how many satellites were being tracked and uh, what sort of uh, signal strengths you were going you were getting and uh, stuff like that. Um, so uh, there could be a lot of different things going on there. But yeah, you might be just getting um, bitten by the whole uh, jerk velocity thing. So it's the top of the hour. Um, 
I'm going to stop the broadcast, folks, and then I will hang out at the chat for a few minutes. So thanks for um, spending your time with me um, and uh, looking forward to seeing you during the rest of NARCON. Bye-bye.